Well, I want you to turn your Bible to Luke chapter one, and uh, we're going through the book of Luke uh, through December. And I came across something uh, this week that I found honestly uh, terrifying. <laughs> Just ain't gonna lie. Um, it, I, I came across something. It's allegedly a, a training aspect from the. Peace Corps training manual in which they're training volunteers to go, uh, to, to go into the Amazon. And the reason why I say allegedly, I wanna be honest, I didn't actually see like a, the PDF document of this. I just saw it referred to specifically the section in how their volunteers are to respond if they encounter an anaconda. Okay, like, like, okay, I'm, I'm just gonna read what, what I, I came across, okay? I'm not making this up. Um, maybe somebody else did, I don't know, but Peace Corps training manual, uh, anacondas. First of all, they say, don't run. They say, anacondas are fast enough to catch you. I'm like, prove it. I mean, that's what I'm gonna say. <laughs> and if, if I'm with someone else, it's like that whole thing. If I'm faster than him, that's all that counts. But as they say, don't run, they say, lie still, keep your arms close to your side and your legs together, tuck your chin in. Like you're supposed to be thinking of all these things. Here's the part that really got me. It says, the snake will come and begin to nudge you and climb over your body. The next thing is what I really struggled with. They said, do not panic. <laughs> if God ever came up with a situation for me to panic in, it's when an anaconda is crawling over top of me. They, they, they went on to say, at, uh, they, they said the snake will probably begin to swallow you from the feet in first. Do not try to resist. And again, they, rep they repeat at this stage, it is especially important not to panic. The snake will begin to suck your legs into its body. This will take a long time. You must lie perfectly still during this process. When the snake has reached your knees, slowly and with as little movement as possible, reach down, take your knife, and very gently insert it into the snake's mouth between its mouth and your leg, then suddenly rip upward and sever its head. The last point was, be sure you have a knife. I read that on Tuesday morning when I was doing some preparation. Our guys came up for sermon prep and I was sharing this. And, uh, I, and then I was going on explaining why I wanted to share this. And Matt Ritchie, Pastor Matt, like I, I was talk, I'd been talking for like five minutes and, he, and, and like literally he's looking at the ceiling and finally he's like, wait, I, I haven't heard a word you've said since you told the story. And I'm like, yeah, I, I know. And, 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 and he said, I think you really need to transition, you know, like slowly because he was like, I'm still caught up in this whole anaconda thing. Like I, I read this and I got, I, I, I literally got goosebumps. And I guess they're doing what they need to do. Like if you're gonna be spending time in the Amazon, God be with you. Um, but I guess you need to be prepared for what you're going to face. And, and I would say that, you know, there are, there are probably some good fears, some fears that, that are good. That's probably, you know, something you should be afraid of, you know? Like, I, I, I think about it. There are only two things I can think of that I really have phobias about. One of them is uh, just because I've had friends, I've had serious accidents, and I fell one time off a roof. I'm really nervous about climbing super high on extension ladders. That's just a thing for me. Some of you are like, no big deal for me. Once you've fallen off a two-story roof, like, you, you have a little fear of that. Secondly, um, secondly, I just... I don't like snakes, I just don't. Like there's a reason why Satan took the form of a snake in the garden, you know what I'm saying? Like, so I got an issue. So, so there are good fears. Good fears can uh, potentially save a life, but I would also say that there are bad fears. And I, I think the bad fears can paralyze a life. And you know, last week in Luke 1, in this interesting introduction to Christmas, we looked at the story of Zachariah, a guy who, who was afraid that something wouldn't happen. 
He and his wife had prayed for, had prayed for a child and, and they were way up in years and he didn't think it was going to happen. And yet he has this encounter with God. Well, as we pick up our reading in, in verse, uh, what is it, verse 26, um, we're, we're gonna be introduced to a, a teenage girl named Mary who has to face another fear. It's a fear of knowing that something is going to happen but then saying, okay, what could potentially happen as a result of this? What are gonna be the consequences of whatever is going to happen, happening? This morning, uh, David and Lisa, I really appreciated them leading us through the Advent part this morning. We lit the Advent candle of hope. And, and I wanna talk about a, a definition of hope that, that I stole from, from another pastor uh, I kind of modified it, and it's this. Hope, in the Christian sense, is the expectation of future blessings and the confidence that the best is yet to come. So let me say this again. As we're talking about what I'm gonna talk about today, and we're gonna talk about fear and, and, and paralyzing fear and, and this, this fear of hopelessness, I want us to think about this. Hope is the expectation of future blessings and the confidence that the best is yet to come. For some reason, my message last week struck a nerve. What I mean by that is I don't, it's been a long time since I've had as many follow-up conversations, whether it be in person or text messages or people reaching out on Messenger or, or on e, by email and, and sharing their stories, sharing how they're, they're struggling to believe. And, and, and th these are godly people that are reaching out. These aren't, these aren't unbelievers. These are godly people who are saying, like, I, I want to believe, but I'm struggling to believe. And man, I've heard stories of addictions. I've heard stories of, of trying to move forward from divorce. I've heard stories uh, from people that are facing, uh, man, physical things that are overwhelming. I've heard from people that, that are wrestling with what the future is gonna look like after a loved one dies because unless God moves, it's going to happen. We've, we've had some interesting stories. I've heard some interesting stories and what I'm hearing is that there, there's a fear that at times is worse than death. It's, it's, it's more significant than fearing death. It's, it's, it's a fear that I'm going to continue to live with absolutely no hope of seeing anything change in my circumstance. And I think there's this fear of hopelessness that we wrestle with. Listen, even sometimes as believers, it's a, it's a fear that honestly goes way beyond just a phobia of snakes. This is deep and this is real. But as I was reading through Luke 1, setting through Luke 1 over the last couple of weeks, looking at Mary's story, I think there's something that we can learn from this girl. And I'm, I'm just gonna let the story unfold and then we're gonna make some points and some application as we go. Verse 26, it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, you gotta know Nazareth was a tiny little dot if it even showed up on a map, it's just a little dot on the map, okay? Like it's maybe 500 people or so would have lived there at this time. It's a, it's a very, it's a place that you don't usually go to on purpose. But he, he showed up to, uh, it says here, he showed up to a virgin who's, who's betrothed to a man named Joseph. And, and the word that's translated virgin here is a word that when trans, translated in Greek, it normally referred to contextually, if we know that culture, to... Uh, to a teenager who's around 13, 14 years old. So the angel Gabriel, he's already showed up to Zechariah. Now he shows up to this, this girl. She's of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And, and, and like, like, I get that, like, but it's interesting. Last week we were talking about how so many times in the New Testament, if somebody encounters an angel, it's not like that whole precious, precious moments figurine type thing. Like, it's, it's a legit fear. Like, the first thing they have to say is don't be afraid. But interestingly enough, Mary's one of the few people that encounter an angel in the New Testament that she, she doesn't quake in fear at the sight. She's troubled by what they have to say. 
I mean, just, just suppose that, you know, like this morning, we're, like I'm preaching, all of a sudden the doors burst open and uh, secret service agents come rushing in and they come to your row and they said, we've been looking for you. We need, you need to come with us. And they take you out and like, you're, you're trying to figure out what is going on right now that, that like the secret service, you know, they work at, you know, at, at the behest of, of the president, what, what's going on? And like the president would have to, he'd like to have a word with you. And you're like, well, I'd like to have a word with him. But no, I'm just saying like there are, uh, sorry, I couldn't help myself. There are moments I just gotta, I don't have that filter. Anyway, uh, but let's just, let's just say that, you know, you, you go out and you're like, no, what? Like, I'm just an ordinary person. What's going on here? Like, what, what's the big deal? Well, then, I, I want you to put yourself in the story. That is what is, is taking place here. She, this, this is Mary. Like, who am I? Like, I don't have any rights. I'm a, I'm a kid. I, uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm engaged. But, but like, who am I? I'm in this little podunk town. And she, so she's trying to figure this out. And so Gabriel says to her, don't be afraid, Mary. Listen to this. He said, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom, there will be no end. Which by the way, it's kind of cool. Uh, these were familiar words. He's actually quoting from Isaiah 7. Uh, for, uh, there in 2 Samuel, where actually there's, there's this promise that God makes David that, uh, that out of his lineage, his throne is gonna be established forever. These are words that she would have even heard in the synagogue at different places. And so he tells her this. And when he says this though, she's still like trying to wrap her mind around this. And she says, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Which I think actually is a really good question to ask. And the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And then he does a callback, a, a throwback to, to Elizabeth. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. And then he says this incredible phrase, for nothing will be impossible with God. Why don't you look at Mary's response? She said, behold, I am a servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, I, I wanna take like a conversation. I, we have no idea how long everything took. And I just wanna break this down. There are some things that we can learn that, that I know sometimes it can be like, you're exaggerating what happened in a short amount of time, but I think there are three specific things that Mary did that we can learn from, especially when we're facing situations, even as, as sons and daughters of God, where we believe that God is able, but we, we just, we, we believe it up here, but man, what I feel, I just struggle with this. And I, I think it's good for us to examine because you know, like Zachariah questioned the angel and he got put in time out for like nine months. Uh, Mary questions the angel and she gets an explanation. What, what was the difference? Like why, why didn't Gabriel respond to Mary like he responded to Zachariah? And I think there are a couple things here. And I just wanna hit this very quickly. I think there's two different types of doubt. I think there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this, I'm gonna call this dishonest doubt. I think there's dishonest doubt that comes from disbelief. Where, where it might come from a place of bitterness from what you've experienced. It might come from, honestly from a place of pride. It's, it's a disbelief that say, says, I don't care what you say, that can't happen. Don't you, don't you know? Have you ever worked with a person like that? You know, you, hey, what if we try this? Never gonna happen, that, that won't work, that's a terrible idea. You ever worked with somebody that just knew it all? Like they, they, they don't even wanna entertain any other possibility than what they have up here. Sometimes that comes from a place of, of pain and disillusionment and cynicism. Sometimes it just comes from a place you're arrogant. But there's this, there's this dishonest doubt that's, that's closed-minded, refuses to consider other possibilities, just makes assertions and walks away, that's impossible. 
On the other hand, I think that there's an honest doubt. And, and I think as Christians, instead of running from our doubts, I think we actually need to understand that there are some doubts that are okay. There, there are some honest doubts. These are honest doubts that come from a place of, man, are you serious? Like how? How, how can this be? This, this is what Mary's asking. How, how's, this, how's this possible? She's not saying, she's not saying, man, never gonna happen. Like Zachariah was like, no, don't you see? We're already too old, gave him all the reasons why it wouldn't work. No, she's like, I, how, how this happened? I mean, here's my state, here's what I'm facing. How in the world can this be? It's, it's, it's genuine questions that are coming from a posture of, of humility of saying, I, I, don't, I don't get it, but, but show me, show me. One of my best friends is Brian Taylor. Maybe you know Brian, he used to be the executive pastor here. And, uh, and what I love about Brian is he asks more questions than anybody I know. But it's, it's always coming from a place of he wants to learn. In fact, I've told him, I said, man, I, one thing I've learned from you is just watching you. you. You don't, you're not too insecure to ask questions. And because of that, man, what Brian is doing, what he does, he's incredibly gifted. But he asks questions. It's this, it's this honest, these honest doubts that ask questions that poke and prod, but it's, I'm open to belief. I just have never experienced this. I don't see it. And I think when we look at Mary and, and, and Zechariah, this is the difference between their questions. What Mary is asking in essence is just, man, I want to believe, just, just give me something. And so Gabriel does this. He, he not only gives her, gives her the answer to the question, how it's gonna happen. He, he also, it's kind of cool, let her know that she's not the only one experiencing a miracle. Like she would have known because Elizabeth related to her that, that Zechariah and Elizabeth have been wanting to have kids and so, so there's this extreme where Elizabeth is, you know, 70s, 80s, hasn't had a kid, been praying for a kid. She's having a baby all of a sudden. And now we've got a virgin who's never been with a man or anything like that. You're gonna have a baby. It's like, whoa, 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 man, this is huge. And, and so Gabriel closes it all though with this phrase, nothing will be impossible with God. And I think that when, like, again, we know this up here, but when we look at our situation, we read those words, it's, it's easy for us to just keep going. We might underline it because we want to believe. It's kind of like a mantra that we'll, we'll put on a T-shirt or hang on our wall. But man, when it comes to experiencing this, man, we're like, ah, the, you know, the dad of the demoniac, I believe, help my unbelief. I have a question for you though. Instead of maybe doubting yourselves, in fact, some of the conversations that I've had this week are people saying, in fact, I just had one at the end of last service of, of somebody saying, man, is there something wrong with me that I'm going through what I'm going through? And I think instead of just asking ourselves, maybe there's, if, you, if you're aware of something, that's one thing, but instead of, of doubting this and obsessing over this or, or even just like the whole why question, God, why, why, why? Doubting God, how could a good God let this happen? I've got a question. And it's the question I want us to just kind of hold this morning. Are you willing to doubt your doubts? Are you willing to doubt your doubts. Because it's interesting, I've seen this, this little girl, her, her, her response to the angel, there, there are three things that she did to, because I mean, what she's f facing, there, there, there's some fear that's associated with this. There, there's a hopelessness of God doesn't move that's associated with this. But what she does is, first of all, to move past this, I like the fact that she seriously thought through her doubts. Like when the angel showed up, she's troubled what he says. She's trying to discern what, what he's saying to her. That, that in, ver, in verse 29, that word discern, the, it, it's translated from a Greek word that is a, an accounting term. It, 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 it gives you this idea of having two scales and, and you, you, know, you have something in this scale, something in this, and, and you're trying to weigh what, what's really going on here. What, what is happening here? She didn't turn off her mind to experience and believe in God. In fact, I'm gonna say something that might help somebody. Biblical faith is not a blind faith. If you feel like you have to turn off your mind to believe in God, it's probably not biblical faith. Faith is not 
merely an emotion. Love emotions. And, and, and man, there are emotions that accompany faith. Don't get me wrong. But, it's, but faith doesn't come from emotions. No, I, I man, faith, uh, John Piper put it this way. He said, faith is not having everything figured out, but it's neither is it jumping off a cliff into the inky black darkness. No, he said, faith is responding to a glimmer of light. Like, you don't have to turn off your minds. I've had the opportunity just recently to talk to different, different parents that are really worried about their kids. You know, their kids are getting older and, and maybe their kids are beginning to question things, question why we do this. Why do we go to church? What is this whole thing? And, and I've, I've, heard, I've heard parents say, like, man, I'm worried that my kids are going to lose their faith. And I, I, I think I know what you're saying when, when you say this, because the reality is this. We, we have, as as uh, Christian parents, we, we have this umbrella of faith. You know what I'm saying? So like, like for instance, my kids in our house, like they don't need to even ask, you know, hey, am I going to church? Like that's just, it's going to happen. Like there are things that we do that come under this umbrella of faith that come from our convictions as parents. But the reality is my, my kids, all of, uh, you know, they're high school and above. My, you know, oldest, he's married now. My, uh, my middle daughter, she's in college. And f- with all of my kids, before they leave for college, I have this conversation with them. I'm like, hey, you've lived under this umbrella of faith, but now you're gonna go out and I want you to have a personal faith. I want you living based on my faith. You gotta have a personal faith. And, and listen, parents, I know you're worried. They're leaving the home and all this sort of thing and they have questions and you're scared they have questions. Don't be scared that they have questions. Actually value the fact that they're asking questions. The only way for faith to be grown is to ask questions. And I'm gonna tell you right now, if God isn't big enough to handle your kids' questions, he's not God. And I think there are times where like, oh man, well, what's gonna happen? No, 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 no. No, questions are huge. In fact, I, I'm reading a book on apologetics, which big word that literally is just talking about uh, what's it mean to be able to explain the, the faith. And it's, it's just a great book I've been reading. And uh, in it, there, there's an account of the, of the uh, conversion of the early theologian, Augustine. And, and I, love, uh, I love Augustine, man. He's impacted even how we interpret scripture today. But, but, but Augustine was talking about, he, when he was a young man, he, he just began to test everything, began to ask questions. In fact, he said that he committed himself to total skepticism. But there came a point that, that he, he, and I'm summarizing what he said, he said that the only way he could be true to total skepticism was to be skeptical of his skepticism. And so what he did was he took his doubts about God and took God and put them both under the magnifying glass. And it was him actually asking those questions and wrestling with doubt that led to his conversion. And I'm gonna tell you, we would do a lot better at allowing our kids to in a safe place, wrestle with their doubts than saying, you better believe this and better not turn from this. That's parenting one-on-one advice. I'll be here all week. You just look me up. I'll just give you more things, you know. We'll deal with money next time. But no, no, this is what, what Mary did, I think is so powerful. She seriously thought about her doubts. She weighed them. And I would just give a simple challenge. I'm gonna give you application as we go through this today. A simple challenge to those of you who are overwhelmed by hopelessness, the fear of hopelessness right now. Instead of losing yourself in the feeling of hopelessness, dig in and ask questions about why you're fearing what you're fearing and feeling what you're feeling. Question your doubts. But Mary didn't just stop short with thinking through her doubts. I like the fact that she sincerely voiced her doubts to God. She, she asks the question, okay, so you get, this, you get this message. How's this going to be? She, she really, what she's doing is like, God, I don't, I don't get this, explain this. And I, I man, I think there's a difference between us having these doubts and we have them internally and we just shove them down. In fact, sometimes we're afraid that God's gonna be mad with us if, if we voice doubts. And, and so we just shove them down and we try to ignore them. But I'm gonna tell you, you can't shove them down. They're gonna get out on you. You've got to entertain them. You have to wrestle with this. And and one of the best things to do is to just voice it. 
Some of you just need to voice it. It might start with a counselor, but honestly, you need to trust God enough to know that he's not gonna cut you off because you ask him a question. He is big enough to handle your questions. He values this. All the major prophets, if you read all the prophets, ask God questions. There is very rarely a place in scripture where there's, a, there's someone that we can learn from who did not ask God questions. If they could, we could. And so what she does, she's, she's thinking things out. She's going to them. She's willing to admit her doubts, her weakness. She's, she's taking her doubts to them. This, there's, a, there's a sincerity. It's like, man, God, I don't get this. Can you help me with this? Let me, let me, okay, let me illustrate this. I'll tell you something that's from a season I didn't like. So 2020, I'm gonna be honest with you, as a pastor, worst year I've ever had. Hated 2020. Okay, some of you are like, oh, I know. Well, yes, but in 2020, we, it was just impossible to do anything right. Nobody knows what to do. We, we would make decisions on, on services or whatever. And in the same, on the same day in response to the same message, I get somebody saying, you're being too reckless. I'd have somebody saying, you don't have enough faith. Like it was just nonstop. And man, I had a great board. We had a great team. And by and large, it, it, it wasn't, overwhelming, but I will tell you after a while, it's just constant, like a dripping water on your forehead. After I like, dude, if one more person, I'm going to lose it. I'm just being honest, keep it real. Like if you think you have a perfect pastor, you don't. So in November of 2020, like 70, literally, I, I, I think we had, it was three fourths of our staff had come down with COVID. COVID was going crazy in hospitals. And I had to make the decision, we had a really hard decision. We and the board made the decision. We had to cancel service for a couple weeks just to get everybody healthy. Well, uh, dude, literally that week, my phone blew up. People texted me, what are you doing? Well, I can't believe, you know, we're leaving the church. It was just whatever. And you normally, like on a normal healthy thing, I'm like, it is what it is, you know? I, I usually, sometimes you just gotta have Teflon. It's price of leadership. You just go, you just go with it. But man, after a while, man, it just hit me. On that Saturday of that, of that particular week, man, I woke up and dude, I don't even know how to explain this to you, but my body, it didn't work. I couldn't move. I was literally paralyzed. And dude, I'm gonna tell you right now, it freaked me out. I've never had anything like that happen before. And man, my mind's going crazy, uh, not just with everything, trying to have answers for everybody and feeling this weight that it's all on me, which it wasn't, but feeling that way. Now I've got this. And, and literally, I, I've never had a panic attack. I had a full-blown panic attack where I literally, my body, I couldn't move it voluntarily, but it involuntarily began to literally spasm. And, and Lori wakes up and she's like, what is going on? And dude, like, I, I'm not a very emotional guy, but dude, I'm, I'm crying, I'm freaking out. And I'm like, I don't know what's going on. I can't move my body. And man, she, she prays for me, but then she's like, ah, listen, this is a lot more than just this. By the way, you're like, I thought you said you couldn't move your body, your mouth moved. I'm gonna tell you right now, last thing's gonna go for me is my mouth. So like, we were good. <laughs> but, but she's like, man, you gotta, like, you gotta process something. There's something that's not right that's going on here. And like, it, like I am all for Christian counseling. Like we've launched the, the counseling center, Grace Center. I believe in this. I send people to counseling, but, but, there are times that I'm, I'm like, you know, I don't, I don't need this. And I've been going through this, carrying this. Well, I reached out to a good buddy of mine who's the best Christian counselor I know. And I said, hey man, you gotta, I said, here's what I'm going through. You gotta meet with me. And, and dude, I went and met with him. And for two and a half hours, best thing that he ever did was he did not, I thought back on it later. He never told me one thing. All he did was he asked questions and we prayed and we sat in silence for two and a half hours. And, 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 as, as we're going through this, like, man, there were, I was like emotional, like trying to process through stuff and, and he never pushed, he just, we'd pray. But we got to a certain place and he asked me a question that might be, looking back, one of the most significant questions I've been asked and probably moving from that time has maybe impacted my ministry maybe more than any other question. He asked me, he said, what is your perception of God's love for you? And it's weird because I've probably preached on that before. But me personally, I'd never thought about that question personally. 
And I was feeling a sense of hopelessness. I told Lori, I'm like, if I, I just wish I could walk away from it all. I wish I could just walk away from it all. And yet when he asked me that question, he said, I don't want you to answer right away. I want you to give it a few minutes. Dude, literally, man, I, be, I began to, to cry. It was the weirdest thing. I had two pictures pop into my mind. I'd never even thought of before. And after a few minutes, he said, what are you thinking? And I said, you know, it's weird. I said, when I, when I, get, when I spend time with God in the morning, like I, I, every morning, man, I'm in the word, I pray. And, and I'm not trying to be uber spiritual or whatever, because I'm a pastor. I just genuinely enjoy that time. I said, it's almost like, and I had this picture of me sitting with God over at the egg factory. I love that place. And uh, over there at breakfast and, and we're, we're eating together and there was a safety and security that I'm a friend of God. I'm a, I'm a son, there's a safety and stability. And he said, okay, what's the other picture? And man, this is the one that got me. I said, for some reason, when I enter the code on this door to walk into this building, I've never even thought this before, but I got this picture and he goes from being my dad and my friend to being the boss, and I'm pretty sure I can't make him happy. And dude, I've never thought that. That had never happened, but what happened is when I had this experience and this, this challenge to doubt my doubts and, and to just rest with this, all of a sudden, man, I saw something that was different that literally began to change the next several months of how I responded when I walked through those doors. Because the reality was that that picture that was there did not come from God. It wasn't a picture of God. It was a picture that I'd taken from other experiences with people, uh, other experiences going all the way back to, man, when, I, when I'd heard, you're not enough, you're not enough, you're not enough. And, and listen, I'm not the only one that's, that's heard those voices. And yet, when I doubted my doubts, I found out that God was bigger than my doubts. And what I feared and what fueled my hopelessness was not coming from a place of reality. It was coming from a place of, a, it was a false perception, a false story, and literally doubting my doubts. And, and I, I don't wanna overstate this. And taking them to God saved my ministry. I don't know where you're at and what you're facing, but some of you guys, you're scared to doubt. And so all you do is fear. You're scared to take your doubts to God. And so you just become obsessed with this. Mary thought through her doubts, sincerely voiced her doubts. But then what I love is she said yes to God, even in the face of her doubts. I love her response when, when he tells her all of this. She just says, behold, I'm the servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And when she said that, I mean, you gotta understand the culture that she's in. What she's saying is, I'm choosing my hope in your promises more than in my fears of what's gonna happen if you don't show up. I'm gonna trust that what you've said and who you are is greater than whatever it is that I'm afraid is coming down the road. What she was saying when she said, let it, let, let it be with me, she was saying, may I be disgraced. May I lose my dream of marrying Joseph. May I be poor if that's what it means. Well, you know, she had no idea when she said yes, that God was gonna send an angel to Joseph and he was, gonna, he was gonna go through with this. All she knew is that in that culture, if she was found to be pregnant, natural assumption is, you know, you slept around and you're to be stoned. She knew that's what she was facing. And yet she said, yes. And she said, I give up my right to determine my life. I'm going to, I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to ask for conditions. She said, I'm going to say yes, regardless. And real quick, I want to say something. Th those of you that might be skeptics here, a relationship with God does not happen in you having just some religious experience necessarily. Though I believe the Holy Spirit and his faithfulness is working and he's stirring things up and you don't even know where it's coming from. But what it happened, where, where a relationship with God begins is by examining your doubts, voicing them to God and coming to a place literally is of, it's of, of trusting that what he offers is of more substance than what your fears or your, your ideas of satisfaction somewhere else, what that offers. That's literally where it starts. But here's what you gotta know is, is you, you don't stop 
having a, a crisis of faith at, at salvation, like there are going to be things, life happens to us all where we're gonna to come to a crisis of faith. And at the heart of moving forward is this whole idea of saying yes to God regardless. And I'll say this, Christians, there's sometimes we, our faith has stagnated because of somewhere along the journey, we took things off the altar and said, I'm gonna control this. Not that we intentionally did this. We're not like saying defying God, but we've put more faith in our efforts instead of saying yes to God regardless. One of the greatest things that we will do is to say yes because it's through saying yes that we get to know God. It's through saying yes that the experience comes. And God's one of those guys, he, he's, God is a take it or leave it type of God. And I don't even mean that in a, like a, a careless way. He's, it's not a negotiation. He wants our faith. And does that mean that there's zero doubts? No, 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 no. It just means that we say yes in spite of the doubts. Well, the rest of the story, and I'm not, I'm not gonna spend a time on this, my time's up, but um, Mary gets out of town, she goes to see Elizabeth, and uh, you know, it, it, I like what it says when she greeted Elizabeth, Elizabeth it, it said that John the Baptist, her baby, who's, she's six months long, he jumps in her womb, and Elizabeth calls out, blessed are you, talk about Mary, among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. You're like, why'd she say that? Verse 45, she said, blessed is she, talking about Mary, who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And then the, the rest of you know, the story of Mary, she explodes into song. This teenage girl writes an incredible worship song that's right there in, in Matthew in, in Luke chapter one. But, but, but in spite of all of, of what could happen, in spite of what God had told her, here's, here's how she looked at herself. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed for he who is mighty has done great things for me and holy is his name. And what Mary did is she, she grasped somehow that in spite, of, in spite of the circumstances that she knew was ahead, in spite of the doubts and the fears about what could happen, she knew she was favored. And I want you to know, child of God, son or daughter of God, listen to me. No matter what you're facing, the hopelessness of your situation, if we are in Christ, we are favored. That doesn't mean that, oh, well, I'm getting a BMW tomorrow. If you do, praise God, I'm all for that. Like, but it's probably not what it means. Biblically, I put this in your, your notes, favored, the favor of God is simply this. It's us believing that God has restored our relationship with him. He's promised the restoration of all things and he's working all things for our good, even when we can't see it. So how do we close? Number one, doubt your doubts. Number two, voice your doubts. And number three, after you've done that, man, one of the most significant things you can do, it's not like you're, you're gonna get rid of all the doubts, but say yes, regardless. Now, are your circumstances gonna change overnight? Nope. But I will tell you this, the more you begin to think of what God has promised and who he is, hope trumps fear every, every single time. And here's what we know, that Jesus is actually the personification of our hope. I like what they said in the Advent reading, he is our hope, the one who, who anchors our expectation, of future blessings and confidence that the best is yet to come. Fears will come. But God is greater. There is nothing impossible with God. Let God do what God's gonna do and trust him.